Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us and giving us the opportunity to present Crichton's results for the last six months to you. Just a, a brief overview before I hand over to, to uh, Eamon to give you the detailed financial results, which hopefully you've all seen anyway. But we have had excellent progress over the last six months. Organic growth has been fantastic in every sector of our business. We had a, a gap, as you know, of 14 million one-off hygiene sales. We were very lucky to turn the company around last year and, and uh, be able to facilitate the need for hygiene uh, uh, products. We did it quickly. We did it well. We made some money out of it, and it amounted to 14 million. However, hygiene is everywhere. Hygiene products are everywhere. There is no demand for them any longer. So we had to fill that gap. We filled it very quickly. Um, and by the end of this year, we, we should have closed that 14 million gap. We're certainly on a, in a very positive situation as far as sales and sales momentum is concerned. As a team, we decided to bring it on board ahead of strategy. We have done that. Gary um, is our new recruit. He's the head of business strategy, Gary Armstrong. He will run through his CV and um, give you his background in a few minutes. But um, the, the thing is, we have established a team now who are searching for suitable acquisitions. We will also use that team to identify sources of equity finance if we need it. And we're also making sure we have the people to cope with those acquisitions. Uh, we institutional investment uh, may be required, and if so, we have the team to negotiate that. And as as some of you have all uh, as already pointed out, we probably need a city broker as we grow, and we're prepared to look at that and uh, and and organize it in due course. We are happy and keen to structure the leadership for further growth that means we've got to strengthen around william and i who have been with the company quite a long time william is our uh, chief executive uh, major shareholder and we know that we need to bring other people in alongside uh, and, and strengthen and and gear for growth for the for, for the long term We've also appointed a head of digital strategy. Gary will go through that with you, um, but his name is Carl Moss. He's ex Feel Unique, who have been in headlines recently. They were sold for 132 million. He was a shareholder and director of Feel Unique. When they were sold, he cut ties with Feel Unique, and he's now a consultant and advisor to us on digital strategy. That's our positives in the last six months. We're geared for growth. We're keen on growth. We love growth. And I'll now hand over to Eamon to take you through the financials. Thank you. Thanks, Bernard. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'd like to just uh, take, take, you, take you through some of the financial highlights of the, the results that we released uh, just before the uh, new year. So these are comments in respect of the six months ended uh, September. So just to take you through some of the financial highlights. So we've made excellent progress in offsetting the loss of the one-off hygiene sales of 11 and a half million compared to the same period in last year. Excluding hygiene, core sales have increased by 8.37 million with growth across all business units. And Pip is going to take you through that growth in some detail later in the presentation. So the above success contained the overall sales reduction to 2.37 million, uh, with net sales for the first six months of 30 million compared to 32.3 in the same period last year. The gross margin percentage increase, mainly due to some exceptional COVID costs that we would have incurred in the um, cost of sales in the previous period last year, and those didn't recur in the current period. So obviously the success then in closing the hygiene gap limited the negative impact on operating profit before exceptionals to 0.42 million and the operating profit before exceptionals was 2.6 million. The exceptional costs in the P&L that are 0.2 million, they refer to the acquisition costs. Under the accounting standards, you're no longer permitted to 
capitalize those costs, they have to be taken to PL. So we've disclosed those on the on the on the face of the PL as exceptional items. So just continuing with some of the financial highlights, operating profit as a percentage of sales. You can see there's 8.6 compared to 9.3, mainly reflecting the reduction in turnover and profit after tax then 6.6 compared to 7.5. Diluted EPS, mainly in line with the reduction in earnings, is 2.61 compared to 3.31 in the previous year. As Bernard has mentioned, we've successfully completed the acquisitions of Emma Hardy and Brody and Stone during the first half. Brody and Stone came right at the end of the first half and Emma Hardy came towards the end of July. So uh, they haven't got a uh, material impact in these in these uh, first half results and uh, we look forward to the contribution uh, in the second half and in the in the uh, future beyond the, beyond the second half. Short term borrowings are 2.9 million compared to positive cash in hand. So I'll take it through the cash flow later on and just demonstrate how the business was funded during the course of the six months. Obviously, we had two significant acquisitions to deal with, so that utilised up our cash resources, and we did draw down some additional borrowings to help us uh, finance those transactions. And then finally, an interim dividend of 0.15p per ordinary shares to be paid in February. So just to look at the revenue, the, the turnover in, in, in a little bit more detail, here's a five-year chart of sales and a couple of things to, to really draw out of this presentation. You can see the six months we have turnover of 29.2 from the core business. And if you compare, look to the box immediately to the left, that the equivalent comparison last year was 20.8. So we've significant increase in the core business there illustrated. A couple of other points to make. Um, we have the one-off hygiene sales in the previous uh, half of 11.54. And you can see the full year there, we have 3.06 hygiene sales in the second half. So that's the 14 million in total. They were Those sales were front-loaded in the previous year. It's interesting just to look at the second from the right there. The second half uh, sales was 26.1 million. So like for like, the comparison is 29.2 that we've achieved in half one compares to 26.1. So that just illustrates the dynamism and the extent of the growth in the core business. You can see there finally the acquisitions, principally Emma Hardy sales, uh, reflected in the P&L is 0.79 million in this first half. So those sales then uh, represented in an operating profit before exceptional to 2.6, which compares to 3 million in the previous six months. So the operating profit is basically reduced in line with the reduced turnover. We had, as I mentioned earlier, some saving in the non-recurring COVID costs, which were incurred in the previous six months. And we also had some uh, production efficiencies in this period. And we've already referred to, you know, we're, we're gearing up and strengthening the management team uh, in anticipation of future growth. So we have seen administration costs grow there, uh, as, a, as I've mentioned, 6.9% as we plan for future growth. This graph here just illustrates the operating profit as, as a percentage of turnover. You can see the top line there is the operating profit, which is 8.6%, which compares to 9.3% in the equivalent six months. And then the white line then is the profit after tax. So again, the same trend evident here, we were seeing a reduction in profit as a percentage of sales, more or less in line with the uh, reduction in turnover. And then they, those numbers flow through there uh, in terms of the diluted EPS calculation. We can see it's um, 2.61 compares to 3.31. So basically, as, as I've commented on the previous slides, the reduction in turnover uh, is, is, is driving a, a reduction in operating profit and earnings. Uh, and that flows through to the EPS calculations. Uh, we did have 3.7 million new share options issued to employees in the year ended March 21. Uh, so they have it. They will have an um, an impact in the current in the current year um, EPS calculations when we do the diluted EPS calculations. And we did, as as we've disclosed, uh, also issue 2.6 million uh, shares in respect of those acquisition transactions of Brody and Stone and Emma Hardy. And I have a little bit more to say on the acquisitions, uh, just to illustrate how they're accounted for uh, later on in the presentation. So this is the cash flow statement. So the, the column on the left is basically the six months to September 21, with comparison then to September 20 and the full year March 21. So you can see the bottom line there, we had a reduction in cash of 
minus 5.5 million. Uh, just really to highlight some of the big cash movements. Obviously, the cash from operations, 2.374, which is down on the um, previous year, 3.3 then compares to 3.8. You can see we have a significant increase in working capital. So this is the lumpy nature of some of the business that we had in the first half. So our stock and debtors increased reasonably significantly there in that first half. And that's reflected in higher working capital. And that position will gradually unwind over the second half of the year. So you can see the working capital movement with an increase in inventories of 4 million and debtors of 2.5 million. We have made the cash investment in the acquisitions uh, comes into the cash flow here of 7.5 million. Um, and we disclose those um, at the time of the announcement. And we do also have, you know, decent capital spend of point. 8 million in the first half of the year. We have previously said we are on an efficiency drive. We're going to invest in our production capabilities in order to drive efficiencies and reduce costs. And this is part of that ongoing program and will continue into the, into the second half and beyond the second half. And then finally, just to make reference there, you can see we have a, an additional funding of 5.094. So we did take out a term loan of 3 million uh, to help us support the acquisition, uh, which will be repaid uh, over a four-year period. And uh, we've also got uh, short-term borrowings, which is r largely around working capital finance uh, to help support those uh, higher stocks and debtors figures. And again, we'd expect that to unwind uh, over the second half of the year. Just some highlights on working capital. Stock levels, as you can see, increased by 4 million compared to the 2020 levels, including 1.9 million on the acquired businesses. Stock turn is less than last year, 3.2 compared to 4.62 times last year. I think last year's numbers were impacted by the hygiene sales. So we had quite high sales, as you saw in the previous year, of over 11 million. And, and that reflected in a, in a higher stock turnover last year, which wasn't repeated this year. Uh, trade debtor days is slightly down on the previous year, 47 days and 48 days. We continue to monitor debtors and credit control very closely. We have credit insured all our debtors. We don't do business on, unless we have credit insurance with the account. And then just we have our debtors have increased by 8%, excluding acquisitions and would say this decline of 9.8% against the prior period, excluding acquisitions. And I think that's reflecting some higher sales in the months leading up to the half year is what you're seeing in that comment. This is all information presented in the half year statements that when we released, but it's worth just summarizing the acquisitions because they were a material part of the first half of the year in terms of cash, in terms of activity. And we've summarized the Memo Hardy and Brody and Stone. You can see the total assets acquired, 4.86 billion. They were very similar, actually, um, and 4.85 net assets for Brody and Stone. We have intangible assets acquired on acquisition of 5.13 million uh, for Emma Hardy and 4.98 million. And it's probably worth just saying in accordance with the accounting standards, uh, IFRS 3, they'll be included in the balance sheet as intangible assets and will be subject to annual impairment on an ongoing basis. And then in terms of the consideration, you can see there it was part cash, ordinary shares, which, which we've referred to earlier, 1.6 million and 1 million. We have some deferred consideration for both of them. A little bit more in the case of Brody and Stone. Most of that 900 for Brody and Stone has actually been repaid subsequently. And then we have contingent consideration in respect of the Emma Hardy uh, transaction. So um, I think that's, that's just a, a summary and an overview of the financials and, and confirms what we've, we've already um, released. And if I may, I'd like to hand over to Pippa now, who'll take you through in more detail the sales and marketing activity. Thank you, Eamon, and good morning, everybody. I'd like to start out with just a top line view of the global beauty market, um, which sets the context, I think, of the category that we're operating in. Very strong category globally, currently at 511 billion, with a view of growing 40% over the next three to four years to 716 billion. It's a very strong growth and continually demanded consumer category and one that continues to deliver growth and results across the globe. Interestingly, 22% is now shopped online globally in the beauty industry, up from 14% in 2019. So some nice growth figures, 
but you will see that the projections up to 48% of total purchase by 2023 are quite considerable in terms of how much share of the market consumers will be doing in terms of buying online. So considerable and a point in terms of our development, in terms of our digital investment. 46% of what is being traded globally is actually happening in the Asia Pacific region. China obviously is contributing to that quite significantly, but there are other areas of that region that are also performing very, very well. And you'll see moving forward a key target for us as we move forward with our brands. 42% of the total global market is skincare. It is considered to be the most profitable category and the most robust category. It is the only category during the pandemic that did not see any decline whatsoever and is still projected to grow 4.6% over the next four years. So very, very strong and a considerable part of the global beauty market. In terms of consumer behavior, it's been very strong and actually coming out of the pandemic is even stronger. A very interesting statistic is that 40% of consumers are now willing to try new products since the pan pandemic, which I think is a very interesting statistic in terms of the robustness of this category and how MPD and new products continue to delight the consumer. And 59% say that they spent the same post-pandemic, if not more. So again, just kind of shoring up how strong this category is globally. Key consumer trends moving into 2022 is the consumer is looking for better pricing and better value. That continues to be a theme with the beauty consumer. They're very savvy, whether that's at the discount end of the market or the premium end of the market, they're always looking for good value. More transparency in terms of the products that they're buying. So they want to understand more about the ingredients, where they're sourced from, um, issues such as cruelty free, issues obviously vegan is a big issue for a lot of consumers, but they just want more and more transparency about what they're buying. Sustainability, as with most FMCG markets, is a core, core subject for the beauty market. And accessibility, the consumer, whilst they have shifted considerably onto online, offline and shopping in store in bricks and mortar is still a very important feature for a number of categories. And the theme moving forward is that online and offline really need to be working hand in hand for best benefit. Eamon has already outlined very clearly the momentum that we've got in the business over the past six months. And this is an opportunity for me to break it down by category for you in terms of seeing where the growth is. So our private label team have moved from 10.7 million to 13 million in the past six months compared to the same period last year. So very strong growth. Our contract division from 4.6 million to 8 million. Our branded core, 5.4 million to 8 million. As Eamon highlighted, the Emma Hardy acquisition at the end of July contributed in the period 790,000 pounds. And just highlighting there again, visually for you, the impacts of hygiene last year. So again, the key theme here is momentum in our core business and how that has enabled us to fill that hygiene gap through the pandemic and the opportunity that we took advantage of during that period. And again, just to outline the share of business of each, of each division, so private label still has the lion's share of our category at 43%. Contract manufacturing is now up at 27% of our total business, increasing by 75% comparing the two periods. Our core brands at 27% of what we do, and then the Emma Hardy brand in the period coming in at 3%. So just some additional detail on each of those categories in terms of what's driving that growth and what the dynamics are in each of them. Um, private label has benefited from our grocery and discount grocery business in private label, which have been very robust during the period. And what is very interesting about private label is that we did not have recovery from a major high street retailer. So that team has still managed to drive considerable growth even with effectively the loss of a key high street retailer that has not come back in private label post COVID, which just demonstrates how strong the rest of those customers are. The top four customers traded very positively in the period with the top two growing in excess of 25% in the past six months. Consumer is still seeking quality products at value prices and that still makes private label very attractive. And we're also still experiencing some onshoring opportunities 
from a number of retailers due to the pressures globally with the likes of COVID, Brexit, social responsibility targets, and obviously global supply chain challenges. So private labels standing up very, very well in the six month period. Contract manufacturing has had significant growth in the period compared to the six months the previous year. One of the things that we have done is in going out to new customers, we're demonstrating more category expertise. So as opposed to presenting ourselves as a generalist in contract manufacturing, we're really honing in on our expertise in both manufacturing and formulation development in key categories. And that's boding very well for us in terms of winning new business. So for example, our expertise in the self-tan category, our expertise in baby, our expertise in skincare, and our expertise in luxury bathing, amongst other categories, and really presenting ourselves in a very different way to the market. And that's, that's proving very successful in terms of attracting new business. The top existing contract customers performed incredibly well during this period and have been significant in driving that growth. Um, we're seeing that these top, top contract customers have got brands that are performing very, very well in export markets, and that's been driving significant volumes through to us in terms of manufacturing. Skincare category continues to be a big driver for us in contract. And again, very similar to private label, we're winning new opportunities with um, brands that are global brands and are wanting to satisfy their UK and EU demand through UK manufacturing options as opposed to um, options where they have in the United States currently or out in China. Been very positive for that category for us. Brands has had its most significant growth period since we have been operating in brands at 47% up. It's being driven by our UK and global markets. We've had lots of momentum. Again, much like private label, we had a, an entire category that has not recovered post COVID, which is the off price channel in the USA market. It is beginning to recover now and I would hope during the next 12 months that actually will grow quite significantly but in the period that we're comparing we've achieved that 47 percent growth despite having that channel not perform post-covid and one of those reasons is that we have continued to extend our brands into multiple channels um, so we've moved into convenience we've moved into the pharmacy channel we've, we're doing more in the grocery channel and the high street channel across the whole piece which is proving very well for us we're getting good organic growth with our core Crichton's value brands, particularly hair care and skincare, and obviously investment in the growth in Mastige and premium brands with one of the most you know, significant events that we've done in the past six months with the purchase of the Emma Hardy brand, which I will talk about in more detail on the upcoming slides. I wanted to break down, because it has been the most significant growth period for our brands over the past six months, I wanted to just go into a bit more detail as to some of the things that are happening in that in that category that is delivering really well for us. So again, like I said, 47% up on the half year, now representing 27% of our total group sales. 40% of what we are doing in branded is happening in overseas markets. And actually, we're not operating in that many markets, we're just operating with some very strong retailers in some very strong markets. Four of our key retail customers globally performed incredibly well during the pandemic. Um, they stood up, they either stood still or grew, and that has accelerated even more post pandemic. And I think that is supporting our strategy that we've outlined for some years now about wanting to work in key markets with the top performing global retailers. And I think that stood in that stood us in very good stead over the past six months and will continue to over the coming six months. Obviously, the biggest game changer for us in terms of brands that happened in the past six months was the purchase of the Emma Hardy brand. And again, I'll go into a bit more detail on that in the coming slides. Feather and Down is definitely on top for us at the moment. We've had significant distribution gains, both offline and online over the past six months. Our sales team have done a, a, a tremendous effort in really getting the Feather and Down brand into key retailers in the UK. As of February, you will see us in every major retailer um, in the UK with a big launch going into Superdrug next month, which is very exciting for us. But the brand continues to go from strength to strength and is doing very well for us on marketplaces online as well. So we have high hopes for Feather and Down and its continued growth over the coming six months. 
We also have dynamic brand growth elsewhere. The Balance Active brand that we bought in July 2019, we've achieved four times sales growth on that brand since we purchased it just over two years ago. Again, Balance, um, that has predominantly been in bricks and mortar. 50% of what we do in Balance Active is in overseas markets. That continues to go from strength to strength. And in recent months, we're seeing some nice growth happening online. And I think Balance Active will be sitting here talking to you in a few months time with Balance Active having a larger share of its activities happening online as well. As I highlighted earlier, we've got some good organic growth happening in bricks and mortar with our core Crichton's brands. They're doing very well. We've been moving it from the value retailers into the main grocers in particular, both in our hair care and skincare brands. And that's going again from strength to strength. And then we continue to focus on product excellence, and that has been reinforced and sets us up well for the future with awards that we've won just in the past six months. We've won eight key awards, predominantly in the global green categories and the health and well-being categories with Feather and Down. Feather and Down has won five awards just in the past six months, um, which I think is a testament to the brand performance and the quality of the formulations that, as you know, is very important to us in terms of establishing that kind of consumer loyalty and allowing our brands to continue to grow. So moving on to a bit more information on what we consider to be the most significant event in the first six months of our trade this financial year, and that is the purchase of Amahadi. And the reason for that is it's got multiple benefits to our business. It is meeting that aspiration that we have to move into the premium sector. This is the first brand that we have that really is premium in terms of its price positioning and in terms of its standing in the market. One of the things for us that is so important here is that it's changing the perception of our business and our brand externally, but it is also allowing us to change our perception of ourselves internally. And I think, like I said, is, is, is the first big step in, in that ambition that we have to move up the retail price chain, move up the margin chain, and move into the, the premium area. In addition to that, Emma Hardy brings 50% of its sales currently are in the online space with bricks and mortar retailers, but also with the pure play players in beauty, which again is a very significant step forward for us in terms of the mix that we have with our brands and is going to create, we think, a significant platform for growth globally for us in the online space. Just highlighting internally as well, the opportunity that Emma Hardy brings for us is the margin drive. Obviously being in the premium space means that we can drive the margin. That's very important in terms of the mix that we have in terms of brands and in terms of our global growth. So in addition to kind of manufacturing and manage management synergies that will drive a higher return in terms of absorbing this brand into our main business, it allows us to extend into global markets and into regions that previously we have we have not had brands that have probably been well set up to tackle those regions. And Emma Hardy gives us a massive opportunity in terms of moving that forward. And I think one of the things that's very exciting about this brand and attracted us to it is that the consumer awareness of this brand is phenomenal. Um, and in fact, the sales that it's currently delivering doesn't really match the consumer awareness that this brand has both here in the UK and globally. And we're very excited as a team that to be able to close that gap in terms of moving the sales forward to meet that aspirational consumer awareness that it has in the market. So a very exciting opportunity for us. We've been working with the Emma Hardy team and on the brand now for five months, and it is meeting expectations in terms of um, retailer perception of the brand, retailer performance, and in terms of the opportunities that the brand can drive forward. It's very exciting for us. And as I've outlined, a real game changer in terms of, of our perception in the market and our perception of ourselves. The other key thing that happened at the very end of the period is the purchase of Brody and Stone, which brings with it three core brands, T-Zone in the skincare category, Natural World in the hair care category, and Janina in the high-end whitening area of oral care category. Again, a very interesting purchase for us, very different in terms of its driver compared to Emma Hardy, but very interesting and very positive for us nonetheless. 
It is in the area of mass, which we do, are doing very, very well with the Crichton's brands and adds a lot of value to our brand portfolio in terms of both product type and customer base in terms of extending what we already do very, very well in the mass space with our Crichton's brands. This brand is in an area of skincare that is very high on the agenda with consumers at the moment, and that is problem skin, and it's ingredient led, and it's very trend led. And I think that sets us up very well, both in skincare and hair care, to move this, these brands significantly forward with new MPD and extended retail and globally. Uh, the T-Zone and Natural World brands, um, as we have purchased them, do not have um, any significant global coverage. Um, and we are very confident that we're going to be able to push these brands out globally to the retailers that we already are trading with in global markets, but also new retailers. Very similar to Emma Hardy, the brand has very high consumer brand awareness. And again, the sales profile doesn't quite match currently the high consumer awareness of the brand. And again, very exciting for us to be able to work on closing that gap, which is a very strong position to be in, you know, when consumers like a brand and are aware of the brand, what we need to do is get the distribution and the customer listings moved forward to match that expectation that the consumer have of a brand. So very exciting for us as a team. So just summarizing what our current brand portfolio looks like with the addition of these very exciting acquisitions. In the mass space, obviously Balance Active, which we purchased two years ago, coupled with our Body Bliss brand in bathing, Crichton's in skincare and hair care, our Bronze Ambition self-tan brand, and then adding in very nicely to the portfolio, T-Zone in skincare and Natural World in hair care. Many of our brands now operating in the Mastige space. So again, moving up the profile of retail and moving up in terms of the position of branding, Feather and Down doing very well. Curl Company has come on significantly well in the past six months, particularly with listings in mass grocery and internationally, and has got some real momentum behind it. We're investing a lot in social media, moving into the TikTok space with Curl Company and doing very well there. And I have high hopes for Curl Company over the coming 12 months in terms of the additional numbers that it will begin to deliver for us in the Mastige space. And obviously adding Janina in the oral care space which is a very interesting product portfolio, very tight product portfolio, but very strong performing products in terms of performance and strong loyalty in terms of consumer awareness of the brand. And again, I think tremendous opportunities there to move that forward. And then, of course, Emma Hardy in terms of skincare and the premium position that Emma Hardy now allows us to, to develop, which is, again, as I've highlighted, a very exciting time for us in terms of brand development. Digital, very important part of our future. Gary is going to talk a little bit more detail in terms of our plans and what we are going to be investing in terms of digital moving forward. But I thought it was important at this stage to highlight to you what digital is contributing in terms of our overall branded business. We've moved from 11% to 16% in the first half of the year in terms of sales contribution to our total branded business with a projection for the full year of 20% of our total branded sales being in the online space with a view that we're moving that forward quite considerably over the next couple of years. And like I said, Gary will outline that. I think what's important there is we've really changed our thinking in terms of widening our strategy in terms of digital both in terms of global markets, but also in terms of the platforms and the marketplaces that we want to be on and that we're currently starting to trade with. You will see that we have just launched on Feel Unique's marketplace with a four of our Mastige brands. Uh, Emma Hardy already does significant business with Feel Unique Direct, which is very good. Um, but we've managed to add Feather and Down, Humble, Bam Beautiful and the Curl Company to the Feel Unique portfolio, um, which we just launched in the past month. So that will be quite interesting to watch the development of that over the next six months. Drivers for growth, um, for those of you that have watched our presentations for some years, you'll see that this is a solid slide that I present every time and every time we review it, these drivers for growth remain exactly the same. I've touched on many of these already and Gary will go into a bit more detail on some of them. 
I suppose one of the key ones that I want to highlight here is, is the development in our team. Definitely the investment in our sales team on branded as a direct result. We've seen those growth of 47% growth in sales on branded sales. We are continuing to invest in our sales team, both internationally and in the UK, as well as our branded team and across our divisions in contract and private label, particularly within management, um, to ensure that we can continue to drive those categories forward and set ourselves up for growth moving forward. Very important piece of the puzzle for us. Again, a slide I presented last time in terms of the opportunities and challenges in the market, and all of these still stand true. The one that I've highlighted that has changed quite significantly in the past six months and into the forward six months is the input costs and the impact that increases in cost globally and here in the UK market are having on our cost base. As you will all be aware, commodities globally have increased significantly. It's had a, a, a fundamental impact on our raw material prices. Um, transport both globally and in the UK. Wage inflation has obviously affected those input costs. We have gone to the market with cost increases across the piece in our brand, private label and contract business, which has impacted anywhere between about 5 and 10%. I have to say that retailers, both globally and the UK, um, have accepted those increases moving forward. We are moving to an index pricing model with some key customers where costs are very sensitive in some key categories, which will allow us to have a mechanism through which to communicate more instantly to customers because we're finding that costs are coming at us um, with very little warning. And it's important that we put a mechanism in place that we can work more closely with customers dynamics that are happening on, in our markets in terms of costings. So just a summary um, for me of some key takeaways in terms of what we're focusing on. As highlighted, our branded portfolio, changing the structure to a more mastige and premium focus. We are still working very successfully at the value end of the market with our core Crichton's brands and will continue to do so, but we would like to put more emphasis on investment in mastige and premium brands, and that's where our investment um, will be also in terms of acquisition strategy again gary will talk through quality of margin as i've just highlighted and continues to be a key focus for us against all on all three divisions uh, there's a lot of headwind in terms of cost pressures i think we are managing that very well um, but don't want to take away from you know the pressures that is putting on us that we will continue to have margin as a key focus for us moving forward we will continue to segment everything that we do. This has been a very successful strategy for us in everything that we do, and we'll continue to do it. So whether we segment by our trading divisions, by the brands that we have in the different areas in the market that they are, by the consumers and by the channels in which we operate, we will continue as a business to look at how we segment what we do. We find that is creates a very good base for us in terms of managing how we grow each of those areas and, and puts it into context for our team in terms of, of very clear KPIs and very clear drivers in terms of how we move forward. So we will continue to segment everything that we do in terms of analysing the data and in terms of how we break down markets and brands and consumers. And then an ongoing acquisition focus in terms of the, the fourth takeaway, both in terms of how we target, how it adds value to our business and how it generates cash for us. And again, Gary will talk through that in a little bit more detail in terms of our strategy there on acquisitions. So that ends my section of the presentation. And I would like to introduce Gary Armstrong, a new and very valuable member of the team who has joined us very recently as our head of business strategy. And he will take the opportunity to introduce both himself and the core areas that he is focusing on for us moving forward. Thank you, Pippa. Um, hi, I'm Gary Armstrong. Um, I joined Crichton's, as Pippa mentioned, just a few months ago now, uh, having spent the last 25 years or so of my career in the beauty industry. Um, and for most of that time, I was with uh, LF Beauty, uh, which became May Ye May as it is today. Um, I was there for 22 years up to 2019. Uh, and there I was the uh, UK Managing Director for 13 years uh, from 2006 and also became the European president for the brands and private label division 
of LF Beauty for the last six years or so of that time. Um, so in essence, I, I know what it takes to take a business, you know, roughly the size of Crichton's in the UK today to one that's uh, more than twice that size, working across those three pillars of brands, private label and, and contract manufacturing in the beauty market. So the head of strategy role is a new one and I'm focused first and foremost on the acquisition strategy. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but I'll also come on to talk about briefly the second and third points on the job uh, remit there, namely digital transformation and our approach to, su to sustainability, uh, which are both key aspects of our strategy, along of course with the more general points about people and business planning. So our recent focus on brand acquisitions Emma Hardy, Brodie and Stone, as well as organic growth in our own brands, have all highlighted the importance of the brand's business unit in our strategic development. And I'm going to repeat the strategic target of achieving up to 50% of our business in the brand's business unit out of our 100 million sales target by 2023-24. So a significant way to still to go. We've put together a pipeline of target acquisitions in the brand space, and we're reviewing them critically against a bar basket of very specific criteria. Now, there are 13 different criteria there. I'm not going to go through them all because some of them are quite generic, as you will see, in terms of being cash generative or enhancing to profitability, the brand proposition, the potential for the range to be expanded, scalability, sustainability, management strength, integration, all key aspects of any acquisition process. But I will highlight some of the more specific points now as they relate to, to Crichton's. Size of potential acquisition. For us, a strategic acquisition is going to be sort of 10 to 25 million target. And also on top of that, we will be looking at tactical bolt-on acquisitions uh, below the 10 million level. In terms of key product categories, that's uh, key for us that it's synergistic in terms of skin care, body care, hair care, and wellness, um, where there's a lot of opportunity in the beauty market. Customer opportunities is another one to highlight that ability to cross sell and have synergies with our core customers between the brand target and our core business. And also skills, and I'm particularly focused here on the digital skill sets, the marketing skills online, and that ability to have specific consumer insight. And leading on from that, of course, is a presence in that DTC market, that direct to consumer sales, and at least an omnichannel strategy across online and bricks and mortar retail. And also for Crichton's, it's key to have the benefit really of the vertical supply model. Uh, and that's product development, uh, R&D, as well as manufacturing and supply that are key to generating the right synergies from our acquisitions. So in summary, on brand acquisitions, we're building on our historic strengths in mass and mastige, and also specifically targeting now the premium market, where Emma Hardy is our first presence to date in the skincare category. And that strategic development is to achieve a balanced portfolio of beauty and wellness brands all of them with strong sustainable growth plans underpinned by the consumer focused product development and supply platform that is also servicing our private label retailers and our contract manufacturing customers. Pippa has highlighted in her presentation the growing importance of digital to our brands. Um, and we brought fresh thinking in on that strategy in the shape of Carl Moss, whom Bernard has already introduced as, a, as an ex director of Feel Unique. Carl's got uh, despite his youthful looks, more than 20 years experience in e-commerce. And under Carl, we're carrying out a very fast review uh, of our digital efforts to create an action plan using two of our key brands, Feather and Down and Emma Hardy. And they're going to provide a template for our wider portfolio. Um, we're looking at everything from the direct to consumer user experience to the infrastructure itself. And we're looking at using marketplaces much more aggressively in a bid to expand our geographic footprint and to reach a more global audience. This review includes systems and fulfillment as well as digital marketing. So it is a, a cradle to grave approach, making sure we cover all the bases. But in essence, it's a fail fast approach. So we're testing, 
trying, adopting, applying the, the methodology and rolling out uh, to our future plans in a very fast approach. Sustainability is obviously a huge topic, but I'm going to start with the consumer because it's clear from many consumer surveys that most and typically more than three quarters of consumers when asked want their brands to help them make a more environmental or a more ethical choice. When you add on to that the business context that comes from things like COP26 and the ongoing coverage of the climate crisis, it's clear that it's central to the forward business agenda. Most of our sustainability knowledge and our improvement comes from our customers and from meeting their needs and learning about their supply chains. I've just picked one example here, um, which is Thesis, the Sustainability Insight System, which is a performance assessment program we participated in, which we've accessed through Walgreens Boots Alliance, and which has given us valuable feedback on our areas of strength and our areas of relative weakness. And so our strategy is to take forward our strengths, our clear strengths in product specification and product development and build a truly integrated sustainability strategy for the business that covers all the aspects of sustainability. And a clear example of that would be on greenhouse gas emissions, where it's about moving from a, a stance of energy monitoring to a full carbon roadmap program in the future. So big plans in this area for a very complex subject. Um, and there'll be more on that, I'm sure, uh, as we move into future presentations. But right now, I'm going to hand you back to Bernard Johnson to talk to you about the way forward. Thank you, Gary. Excellent presentation. Hopefully, our, our participants found that very useful. Excellent presentation also from Pippa, as usual. Really appreciate the drive she brings to the business and the efforts of her team, which some of whom are listening today, and I'd just like to thank them. Um, and uh, a nice presentation also from Eamon on our financials. Um, so now I'd just like to talk about the way forward. And the way forward is pretty simple for me, but very challenging for our executive team, for us to maintain and increase that sales momentum. We've got huge momentum in the first six months of this year. See no reason why it wouldn't continue. We just need to get, make sure the resources are in place and that we're agile enough to meet any challenges that come along, like supply chains, wage increases, inflation, whatever it may be. We will be agile and we'll attack it right first time, hopefully. Besides the organic momentum on sales, I'd like to add further acquisitions. Our target and our expectation is to add two further acquisitions in the next six to 12 months. That's a big challenge for Gary, but you can see he's going about it in the right way. If, if, if we require it, and if those acquisitions are big enough, we may want to onboard institutional investors. And if we do that, we want to, and we will evaluate the possibility of appointing a city broker. I know some of you shareholders have suggested we do this in the past. Really, the time the time wasn't right or wasn't absolutely necessary. But um, if we do do acquisitions of this of, of of the kind we're planning, it would make sense to have a broker appointed. We continue to strengthen our leadership team. Uh, obviously, we will build around um, William McElroy and myself to take care of any any long term aging aspects <laughs> I, i'm only 21 i've just had a hard life william and i recognize the need to make sure that there's continuity here and that there are people capable well capable of taking over and maintaining what we think we have built as a valuable business we also and pippa has really highlighted the value of improving that middle management team the sales teams the planning teams, the, the manufacturing teams, they're all improving, they're very good. But with Gary's help in strategic terms, we, are put, we want to put in development systems and talent systems so that we maximize their value and bring that to the bottom line. Our research and development has been absolutely tremendous to date. We want to continue that. 
Martin uh, Stevens who will be available to answer questions on our research and development and our quality control systems. Um, has done a fa fantastic job. And I think Feather and Down and the Crichton's brands in general bear testament to that. Digital is another big item on our agenda. We're having quite a bit of success with a 20% of our total branded sales now on digital. Digital in every form, uh, that includes Amazon vendor and Amazon seller, as well as other platforms such as Unique, Feel Unique. Um, and we want to push through the 10 million target in the next 12 months, 10 million per annum target, um, going towards uh, um, a longer term target of 25 million uh, by 23, 24. In the longer term, we still have that target. I know that COVID um, interfered a little bit with it, uh, held us back on that 14 million hygiene gap and the reduction in, in bricks and mortar sales when all those shops closed down last year. But we're back on track and with acquisitions and with Gary's ability to identify good acquisitions in the right category, we think we believe, we strongly believe we can push through that 100 million mark by the end of 2024. Our sustainability plans are fairly ambitious. It has to be because the retailers really set the targets for us. Um, and if Marks and Spencers or Boots or any of the big, the big uh, potential customers uh, that we have or, or might have, say you have to have net zero by 2030 or 2040, then we just got to do it and we plan for it as we always do. So we also climb that D to C ladder and, ha and as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, 25 million is the minimum target we want to achieve by 2024. As we said last time, we want to invest the last presentation. I mentioned 22 million in, in manufacturing upgrades, capacity uh, upgrades, automation, efficiency, bandwidth. In other words, we were able to do a wider range of skin products, a wider range of quality products, and even consider uh, drug-based lotions and potions if we have to, or if we get that opportunity. So we'd be well placed. We, we'll invest at least 2 million in that. We probably spent uh, 800,000. We're getting the return on it. Uh, our, our, our customers bear witness to that because we meet in terms of quality, service, and innovation, I think we're as good as anybody in the market and probably one of the best as far as the, the high street retailers are concerned. We continue to strengthen our core leadership team and widen that with the, I think, good example is Gary Armstrong, as he's just described. He's got huge experience in this industry. He's got leadership skills. He's got executive skills. He's got everything that we need to bring this business to twice its current size. We want also in the background to upgrade our control systems, our ERP systems, and bring them up to state of the art uh, in the next 18 months. Um, there are a lot of uh, advantages to being, being cloud-based and digital-based and being on something like Microsoft Dynamics or whatever whatever it may be. We're evaluating those systems at the moment and planning to implement them and have a full upgrade achieved by the end of uh, 2023. So that's more or less uh, where our aspirations lie. We're pretty confident about those aspirations and we keep parading them, but, but I think we're well on our way to, to doing them by the end of 2024. And then we'll have another set of aspirations, which will be even more challenging. In terms of the financials, if our aspirations are achieved, by the end of 2024, we should be turning 100 million with an EBITDA of 12.5%, a net profit of 10 million, branded sales of 50 million, oh, for, sorry, 40 million plus. I, I say 50 million, because in my head, it's gonna be at least 50 million, but we're pretty confident about 40 million anyway. We'll have contract manufacturing sales of at least 30 million and private label sales of 30 million. And of those branded sales, probably 25 million at least will be on digital. So that's what we're aspiring to. 
and we're working towards and we're pretty confident we can do it. So that's the end of my little presentation. I want to thank all of you shareholders for listening, for being with us, um, and potential shareholders uh, for also listening. Um, I want to thank our staff for doing such a great, great job. All of my colleagues have been tremendous, right down to the, the very last person in the door and the, the, the person last out, the cleaners, the night shift people, everybody. They've done a tremendous job. I want to thank them so much. And I want to thank everybody, including our suppliers and all our stakeholders. It's been a great six months. Looking forward to the future. Thank you. Ready for questions? Then? First question, is any of the increased stock due to the slow-moving hygiene products produced but not sold? Good question. A very astute question. And I think we have to say, hold our hands up and say yes. Some of that, I'm not actually sure uh, Eamon will probably uh, qualify that. I'm not sure of the exact amount, but there is there is a, 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 an amount and we will we are in the process of selling that through. We yeah, have we, made, we have I think Eamon will confirm this, but we've we have made provisions in the in the balance sheet anyway. Yeah, that's 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 it, Bernard. There is hygiene. We do have hygiene stocks that we made last year and didn't didn't sell, but it, it has been provided in full in the account. So so the net stock position is reflected in those numbers. Um, um, doesn't 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 include material uh, hygiene stocks. Thank you very much. And please, could you talk about factors affecting the split of revenue between half one and half two when Christmas related sales are made to retailers, whether supply chain concerns have brought this forward and whether Emma Hardy is more Christmas gift orientated than your other branded business? In terms of the half year to September, things were not pulled forward because of supply chain. So to answer that specific question, so we delivered anything that was seasonal. We have some contract seasonal work. Uh, Feather and Down had a bigger gift program this year than the normal. Um, that was not pulled forward. So the sales that we expected in the first half and the sales we expected in the second half, we did more gifting for Feather and Down online. And actually that will come through in the second half because the sales for that are a lot later because it's not bricks and mortar. So you find that digital sales on gifting go right up until first, second week of, of December. Um, interestingly, we have a number of customers for next Christmas that want us to deliver anything related to Christmas earlier than we did this year as a result of knowing that supply chain impacted a lot of people this year we delivered on we delivered on time um we we managed it and delivered on time this year but it'll be interesting to see the next this next season coming up because i've had some retailers already that want to pull the intake of anything to do with christmas forward by about six weeks so it will be interesting and they're doing that in anticipation that supply chain will still be a problem during 2022 thank you that's great and moving on, if Boots is taken over, how would that affect your relationship with them? And roughly how much business does Crichton's do with them as a percentage? Good question. I haven't, I haven't got Boots broken down as a percentage. I don't think the ownership would make a huge amount of difference to what we do on the contract manufacturing side for them. Um, obviously, the big impact there, which was positive, was when BCM was sold out to Forever. So that actually generated lots of contract opportunities for us. I don't think that'll change unless they fundamentally change their manufacturing base, which I can't see them doing. Um, and I don't think it'll have an impact on brand. Um, if anything, it could be positive, I think. It might be more focused and give us more direction. Um, so I, I don't think it, it could be a negative at all. I, I don't see, how, if we continue to do our innovation uh, at our quality and service and um maintain maintain what we've done in the past there's no reason why it would make any difference hopefully that answers the question that's great thank you very much and could you go into a little more detail about the investment in working capital you describe in the half one report for example is this to mitigate supply chain issues and do you expect it to rise relative to revenue or are these one-off factors 
Yeah, so we've 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 commented on 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 the various increases in working capital in the presentation in the accounts. It's probably it's it's fair to say we the first half we we had a significant piece of uh, a major piece of of um, retail business uh, which we were basically stocking up and uh, had invoiced a lot of it uh, in the first half. So I'd expect a lot of that working capital increase and and has uh, already already. Uh, reversed in, in in the second half if 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 that if that if that's the case we did in the background there is uh, underlying uh, supply chain pressures throughout the business so uh, there's there there is no doubt that, that you know that lead times are increasing supply chains are just a bit blocked up at the moment and um, so we do if, if we feel there's a need to to uh, extend some some inventory we certainly would would do that uh, as well Thank you. And also on inventories, the Emma Hardy acquisition seemed to bring with it considerable inventory. Are there opportunities to reduce this as part of a larger group? Yes, I, I think, well, sorry, I'll, I'll hand back in a second, but I think there are opportunities. But I think if we can double the sales, the inventory will be used correctly in that way. It would be more about um increasing the sales and 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 uh increasing the the, the basic inventory turnover what do you mean yeah i think i i think i i i i i'd, I'd echo those comments bernard and it's probably fair to say we did identify that there will be um manufacturing and management synergies as part of as as, as part of that acquisition so as we gradually move towards an in-house manufacturing situation i think we'll certainly have an opportunity to look at all of those uh in inventory levels as, as we know that's currently the, the, those activities are currently uh outsourced and we'll certainly we'll certainly have the opportunity to to look at those critically as as, as we uh, migrate those in-house great thank you very much would it be possible to know your top five products and what they are in terms of revenue impact Pippa, you might you might want to go on so yeah they would be in the baby and skincare categories um driving both volume and value and then probably beyond the five we get into hair care in terms of some of our branded hair care SKUs. Yeah, the 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 the, the, the skew that the skew and the and the range that's not selling everything is feather and down at the moment. It will be Emma Hardy second, probably um uh our our her care products then our our sunshine blonde and, and uh, that range of products in her care will be third. Um on the branded side, yes, that would yeah, be the on the branded side. Part. Yeah. And I, I don't think we want to talk really about other other uh, customers um products and how they sell uh, you know in terms of our customers we wouldn't want to discuss that i think probably not a satisfactory one but for us it's it's, our, it's where our own brands are selling well and and uh, th those three uh brands are, are selling everything else at the moment thank you and would you consider moving to aim no do you want to, do you want to, no why th this question comes up every year if we wanted to, to move to him we would have done it uh a long time ago um i know there are tax advantages to him but other than that i don't see any reason why we would of course um if there's a good argument we will con we would consider I, I i was a bit a bit too smart there but uh no there are no plans in in our immediate um uh vision to to talk about or to think about him but if a good argument came up other than the inheritance tax one then we we might we might reconsider it thank you and did you acquire staff with emma hardy and brady and stone and if so how well have they integrated and if not how has all the necessary information and know-how migrated good question Pippa. would you like to take that yeah, in the case of Brody and Stone, we didn't inherit any staff. Uh, that was just an outright purchase of the brands and the business. Um, in terms of, because Brody and Stone brands are kind of in our heartland, our team have been able to absorb that relatively well, uh, much like we did with Balance Active. Um, it's products that we understand. Um, it's markets and customers are, are almost identical to what we trade. 
with regard to Emma Hardy, um, a very small team, two very key members that are key to the operation and the management of customers. And then we've kept on Barry Cook, who was the MD of Emma Hardy um, for a period of time during the transition. Um, he's been with us uh, for the first five months and for the foreseeable future. And that's been very helpful in terms of um, transitioning the brand into our business and ensuring that the information flow is, is good. Thank you. And in terms of equity issuance from sizable acquisitions you hope to make, will you be giving retail investors the chance to participate in any capital raises? Absolutely. Absolutely. That would, that would be our, our one of the drivers in it to, to we value our retail investors and we want to um, foster the relationships in a very positive way. So that, the answer to that is yes. Eamon, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, no, we'd, we'd certainly like to like to make that opportunity available um, uh, Bernard, in the, in, the, in the future. Thank you. And you guided for organic sales and EBIT growth this year. Is that still achievable? It's challenging. Uh, I think it's achievable. Would you like to comment on that, Eamon? Yeah, certainly, certainly, certainly plenty of challenges in the second uh, half of the year and probably where, where we're sitting now, I mean, probably our, our, I would say our overall group turnover is probably somewhere in line with last year is where, where we probably would expect it to, to, to come out so, somewhere in that, in, in that area, but a lot, a lot still to go at this stage. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to make too many. Yeah. Too well, many forecasts well, we, I think Pippa, Pippa can come in on this, but we're yeah. pretty confident we can beat last year's by maybe 10p last year's uh, uh, sales. It'll be challenging, but we're, we're pretty confident. The only thing that can hold it back is uh, the the uh, delivery, the the availability of raw materials and the um, delivery, the distribution problems that we have. Uh, and that would mean that we might miss it or, or beat it by half a million. It'll come at a later time. It, it, it's just a, a question of, of de delay in the mechanism, but I don't see any reason why we wouldn't um, achieve that, that last year's figures by the end of this year. Thank you. And are there any more Broad Oak type acquisitions available? How would you say the value of Broad Oak compares with the more recent acquisitions? <laughs> That's another good question. I'm going to hand that over to Pippa. If she doesn't mind taking it, I think they're very different. Um, I don't know if I could directly compare the two. You know, Broad Oak, the Broad Oak acquisition was about manufacturing capability and improving the breadth of what we could do, plus introducing to us a lot more premium customers in terms of contract manufacturing, and was has been very successful for us. Um, the Emma Hardy and the Brody Stone, and if I guess a reference to the Balance Active, is very different in terms of. Um, how I would value it. Um, that's about our brands. That's about us growing different types of customers, different types of consumers. Um, I think I think they're both valuable to to what we do, just in different ways. I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I I wouldn't. The yeah. two wouldn't be comparable to me. They deliver very different things to the business, and all of them positive. The the similarities are between Emma Hardy, for example, and uh, Broad Oak. It there are similar the product was a, a contract manufacturing business um, and we were uh, not very well known in the, in the fragrance end of the contract manufacturing business for example um, so it, it 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 gave us a leg up in terms of how our profile in that particular sector of the market uh, and it brought us into more premium business um, it brought us into the fragrance business, which we weren't in before, and uh, it gave us um, uh, exposure to other uh, to uh, different players. For example, um, well, I suppose it wouldn't be fair to mention the customers in, in, in this kind of presentation, but that's the same. Uh, Emma Hardy brings us into a, a premium skincare category with retailers that we pro probably hadn't dealt with before. So it's the same kind of motivation, but different um, different dynamic. That's great, thank you. And why do you want to do so many acquisitions and potentially finance via equity? Is it not more accretive to do bolt-on acquisitions and finance them with cash at hand or debt? Good question, good question. Um, 
first of all, we would do, we, we would do, we will continue to do acquisitions um, financing out of our cash flow. The driver originally was, you know, we were we were generating five or six million a year in cash once we broke through a certain level of turnover. I think it was about 35 or 40 million. At that stage, uh, you, know, you know, how do we use this cash? And it makes sense to, if you can, like with Broad Oak and with Emma Hardy, it can bring you in a different sector of the market, give you a higher profile and improve your relationships with retailers. It makes sense to do it. Um, I, I think we will continue to do small bolt-on acquisitions, but where we, I would be keen to um, <coughs> to move to is is a a major turnover acquisition like 10 million, which gives you a huge momentum, has double benefits for us because we can well if if it goes to plan, we'll do the manufacturing as well, so there'll be a synergistic benefit. Um, a 10 to 20 million turnover that acquisition that acquisition might cost a, lot, a bit more than that uh, and it makes sense to finance that through equity rather than debt i i think uh, and feel that and we agree that as a board um if something else pops up and it, 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 the argument isn't strong enough then we won't do it but at this moment in time those are the drivers we'll use our cash to do small boat loans we'll continue to do that but it, there, there, there is a, a well. There's a well-being market out there. A skin market. Sometimes they come together, and sometimes, and we have identified about five different targets uh, uh, that that are actually talking to us at the moment. And it, we're not, we're not at any point uh, signing heads of terms or anything. But we, we do know what's going on in the market, and we see some big players out there that would need equity finance and would make a lot of sense for us if we can do it. So the answer is we'll do both. Thank you. And how much will the two acquisitions improve profitability in a full year when fully integrated? I mean, you, 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 you've done the calculations that we're still on course, I think. Yeah, we, 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 we are. I think we said at the time that you know, EBITDA multiple would be, uh, you know, five five times something something in that order. Once we had all the synergies in place, and that's 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 our best view. Of, that's our best view as we proceed. Uh, we're continuing to, um, uh, as I say, bring some of the bring some of the manufacturing activity to make some of the savings that were envisaged as part of the transaction. So we're certainly on track to deliver um, the EBITDA projected uh, for, from both from both transactions. Once we fully integrate them uh, and and have them uh, uh, fully, when we're doing all of the manufacturing, have them fully integrated, have them back to four million turnover, that that should put two million almost on the bottom line. Um, it may or may not. That you know, we may be out by a couple of hundred thousand on each side, but that that's the plan, and that's where mm. we are at the moment. Will the acquired brands' products be manufactured in house, and if so, in what time scale? Yeah, so uh, so the Brody and Stone uh, products are already uh, substantially uh, manufactured in house. We're, we've navigated those in a very in a very quick period of time. Uh, the Emma Hardy products are still currently outsourced, and we've got a plan in place to take those in 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 house in the months ahead. Thank you. And the stock level is forty three percent higher than last year, and you say less than half the increase is Emma Hardy, and also minimal sanitize um, hygiene sanitizer. Why is the underlying stock level so much higher? So well, um, what what we're factoring in as well, we've got increased business as well. So don't forget our branded business is higher. Uh, our our Private label businesses is, is, is higher. Our contract business is higher. So we do we do need higher stocks as well, as well as everything else to, to service the growth the growth in business. So that's just to that's, add to that, Eamon, It's also a moment in time in September, where we had a very large contract with a major retailer that we had just completed the manufacturing. It all shipped out very yeah. quickly after that. So it was a there's a moment in time piece there yeah. as well. That's right. Uh, I think the over. It, it, the overall measure is, is uh, I think it's 3.2 times 4.6. But last year, the, the turnover on the high level of sales and, and hygiene, we were turning the hygiene stock inside days and, and weeks. 
whereas on branded, you, you turn the stock and on retailers, they ask us to keep on private labels to keep up to 13 weeks stock at their disposal. So the, there's a different dynamic last year, but the, the turn is 3.5 and we would hope to bring that up to four uh, by the end of this year. Great, thank you. And which companies do you identify as your main competitors, i.e. those with manufacturing capabilities like Crichton's in the UK? Would Would Gary like to answer that question? That It's good because he has a better knowledge of our, we, we just think we're the best and there's nobody can compete with us, but obviously <laughs> that's a mistake. So mm -hmm. if Gary could correct that and, and tell well, us I who. Think, I think the first thing to say is um, there's a whole raft of um, Competitor companies in the um, in the UK contract manufacturing world. Um, they can be sizable companies like uh, Laylam Healthcare, part of the DCC group. They can be um, uh, foreign-owned companies like May You May. Um, they can be much smaller players, um, and uh, there are, there's a lot of smaller players as well in our sector. Um, so. There's also the overseas competition, and I think that's an interesting dynamic, whereas historically we would have answered somebody we don't know in China to this question. Um, that's actually reversed with the trend towards more onshoring. And there are a number of companies both in um, Asia and in Eastern Europe who've begun to move their business back to UK manufacture. So capacity is... Um, uh, something that is important. We still have capacity in our manufacturing, uh, but not all of our competitors would be in that position. Um, but there are a number of companies there and I've mentioned some of them. I think the one thing, thank you, Gary. I think the one thing we have is the bandwidth. You know, we, we, we're private label. We can offer a, a great service and, and maybe Martin would like to comment on that. You know, we're, we're, we would develop probably 300 um, products in, in a year, uh, just, um, produce or de develop them uh, in the sense of uh, change the fragrances, change the labeling, uh, or, or actually in develop new products from grassroots. Could you comment on that, Martin? Or were we? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we, we, have a, we have a number of types of development work going on. We have a you know, brand new innovative development work where we're working with our own brand customers and with our branded team as well internally and uh, it, there's there's also an element of uh, of changes to products which are already on the market some of them can come from legislative legislative changes we've recently had to do work taking out uh, some perfume allergens on some uh, some products both branded and uh, and retailer products and uh, you know, some companies just want to refresh their brands and uh, maybe change the color, change the perfume, change the packaging. Um, all of it, you know, takes, uh, you know, an, an element of work where we have to go through um, stability, compatibility, and dealing with all the legislative and safety work that goes along with that. And, you know, we have, uh, I, would, I would probably think, Half my development team probably is we would be involved in in yeah just rever, re, revamping ranges and so on, which tends to be an ongoing thing. Certainly with supermarkets, very rarely does a product last more than uh, more than a, probably about two years in a in a supermarket now and then. It's uh, you know it's, it's up for either a range review or changes and so on and we're, we're good at that as well we're very good at uh well plus we we martin we bring in the bambootiful which was a, a her growth her stimulation product we did feather and down which is a well-being product for sleep and and we can do it from the from bottom up or we can do adjustments but the breadth what, what, what i'm really trying to say is the breadth of what we offer it's probably as good as you get out there. Uh, I can't think of any other companies actually right on uh, that do the width that we do. For yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I agree, Bernard. You know, we 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 um, we, we we cover a quite quite a large spread of of product development work. Really, about the, the only products that we don't do are aerosols. And, uh, you know, outside of that, we're, we're covering off powders, baby products, all types of skincare products from uh, 
from very budget to very, very high end. And that's across our own brands and it's across contract manufacture, it's across uh, retailer products. Um, and, you know, uh, like I said, I think aerosols is probably the only area that we, 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 don't actually, we don't actually dabble with. Will future acquisitions be immediately accretive to Crichton's? I think most acquisitions would add something to the bottom line, but look at the ones we're looking at at the moment, most of them would add within six months, would add probably three months, but not immediately. Thank you. And did you say that you expected full year sales to be in line with last year? And is that including or excluding recent M&A? Yeah, yeah, it includes everything, uh, including the reason we did the acquisitions, one of the drivers was to cover the gap. So we will have covered the gap by the end of the year, if, if you know, give or take. Um, and uh, it will include the Emma Hardy and Brody and Stone, and we will have to sweat them quite a bit to make sure of that, but we will. Okay, tremendous. And and that's pretty much the end of questions, but there is a comment here just saying, I'd like to thank management and all the Crichton's team for an exceptional performance since COVID hit. I speak on behalf of a number of long-term shareholders. Thank you and keep the good work going. So thank you very much indeed, Bernard. I think you're probably just about talked out, but do you have any closing remarks? Well, I'd just like to to say thank you to everybody, including yourself, Tamsin and Tim, for this this opportunity to present to our shareholders, very valued retail shareholders um, and potential shareholders. I'd like to thank everybody, and particularly our own staff, some of whom are li- listening, our colleagues, uh, who have done a great job. And just thanks to everybody. Um, and it's it's a real pleasure running this business and 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 with the team. And uh, hopefully adding value to, 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 to the business.